Okay, awesome. All right, really excited to share some of our work with you guys today. Uh, again, I'm Jarek Bautista, and I represent um, a company called Re3D. Uh, and I'm going to talk about our work so far with uh, 3D printing out of uh, reclaimed plastic, especially at the larger scale, how we can make that uh, sustainable technology a little bit more accessible. Um, <clears throat> so a little bit of an introduction to myself. Um, I've been with 3D for about uh, five years now, working as a product engineer for them. Uh, my background's in mechanical engineering and product design. I've done work with um, a bit of a smaller firm in the past called Taylor Boswell and some bigger companies like Schick, Wilkinson, Sword as well. Um, I'm from Houston, Texas. I'm based here um, with B3D and uh, outside of the office, I like to run a lot on my legs and um, uh, I completed my first marathon in February in Austin. Um, a little bit more about uh, us as a company at Re3D, we uh, like to address the cost and scale barriers of industrial 3D printing. Um, and during their days at NASA and in Johnson Space Center here in Houston, our founders were members of Engineers Without Borders. And at that time, they saw the need for um, uh, the need around the world for uh, fabrication of various uh, human scale objects, um, such as birthing stools, lower limb prosthetics, and uh, composting toilets. And these were things that people needed but had no means to make. Um, they were a little bit too big for uh, desktop 3D printers, um, but the existing large scale industrial printers were also cost prohibitive. So um, they found this uh, this portion of the market where they could uh, go into and that led to the creation of the very first Gigabot, uh, which is an accessible human scale 3D printer that lives somewhere between the desktop market and the high end 3D printer market. Um, and now we've extended past our flagship machine, which is the Gigabot, and we've evolved into more of a full service 3D printing company. We still uh, proudly manufacture Gigabots in our factory here in Houston, um, starting at a size of two feet by two feet by two feet in the build volume and going up as big as um, a customer's budget for a custom solution. And on top of that, we, we like to engage with our community. We host free monthly meetups and 3D printing classes. Um, provide training uh, services, as well as 3D scanning, reverse engineering, and contract printing. Um, <clears throat> we're a small but mighty team of uh, 25 dedicated problem solvers uh, who want to make our users' dreams happen through 3D printing. Um, again, as I mentioned multiple times, we're based here in Houston uh, in our factory, but we also have locations in Austin, Texas, and most recently in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, and while we've grown to tackle the barriers of cost and scale head on, uh, we've been steadily working to address another major uh, global issue as well, which is that of plastic waste. Um, and to sort of scope out uh, the problem we're addressing, um, in 2017, just here in the US, we generated over 35 million tons of plastic. Um, and of that amount, um, only about 3 million tons or 8% of that total was recycled. Um, the very next year uh, on a global scale, it was determined that 90% uh, of plastic waste was never recycled at all. In fact, most of it, um, some of it was incinerated, but most of it accumulated either in the landfill or into the natural environment, uh, which is uh, something that we're trying to address here. Um, if it does uh, go into the natural environment, um, something like a plastic water bottle uh, will take about uh, 400 to 500 years to decompose, uh, and other plastics at the worst can end up taking up to 1,000 years to decompose. So obviously that's a lot of, uh, it's a really big problem. That's a lot of plastic waste to deal with and it's gonna be around for a long time. So um, the question became, what do we do with that? Um, we see plastic waste as an untapped resource, um, especially in, in austere environments, uh, places where uh, they're a bit more resource constrained, um, where there's not a lot of infrastructure um, or the supply chain can be a bit uh, challenging. Um, and we see that the distributed manufacturing enabled by 3D printing disrupts this, this need for infrastructure or supply chain, uh, and the missing piece becomes the feedstock. So uh, what if there was a way to create um, useful functional objects directly from the millions of tons of plastic that we generate each year? And we believe there's amazing potential in being able to print from the trash uh, all the way from drastically extending a product's life cycle to uh, job creation around plastic recycling and processing. So um, some of the advantages of 3D printing, uh, some of you guys are probably familiar with this already, but it includes on-demand manufacturing, uh, mass customization at no tooling cost. Um, and again, going back to the, the no need for an extended supply chain, uh, we basically just go from the raw material straight into the final product. Um, our, our hardware solution that we've come up with based on the Gigabot is called Gigabot X, and you can see it on the left side of the slide there. Um, this builds on top of our existing Gigabot platform uh, while maintaining our focus on cost and scale. And in contrast 
to printing with plastic filament, which is the FFF uh, fused filament fabrication uh, process. Um, GBX uses uh, fused granulate fabrication or FGF uh, to extrude directly from pellets, flake and plastic regrind. And essentially this lets us print from trash that would otherwise lie untouched for hundreds or thousands of years. Um, in addition to that, uh, to the GBX, um, we're working on an NSF funded uh, Cibber, uh, which is funding R&D for more complementary products, including grinders, dryers, and feed systems, with the overall goal of creating a miniature ecosystem for users to be able to process and print plastic on their own. Um, so why did we make something like this? Um, first of all, we want to be able to divert waste. Uh, standard size GBXs would be able to um, <clears throat> print with 20,000 plastic bottles worth of material in order to fill up the full build volume. And that's at the standard size. If you go higher, obviously, it, then, you know, the number just goes up from there. Um, the next thing is uh, how do we create uh, circular economies and uh, more circular life cycles? Um, so with a machine that can reuse uh, the same material after it's printed and reground, uh, you can see how um, uh, that helps to sort of close the loop um, on with the help of the complementary products that I mentioned before, grinders, uh, dryers, et cetera. Um, and then going back to accessibility, that's another uh, reason we want to go with this. Um, there are existing pellet printer machines, but they're very uh, cost prohibitive. So with this goal or with this product, we want to um, give people access to a machine that can do this higher throughput, uh, faster printing, larger objects, et cetera, uh, while maintaining uh, an affordable price point for people in the industry. Um, and then finally, accessibility of materials. Um, we're no longer bound by filament and things that are processed into 3D printing filament uh, when we can just print directly from a cheaper or more varied uh, selection of plastics. Um, so now I want to do a little bit of show and tell. Uh, and I'll focus maybe on my uh, screen here. But um, our process so far is in uh, <clears throat> has involved lots of uh, making messes, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, uh, printing lots of blobs. Um, and doing a lot, of, a lot of little accidents. And as we refine and optimize the process for each material, we're able to fine tune the settings such that we can get some pretty good fidelity stuff. Um, and I wanna take a few moments to show you guys some objects in person that I wouldn't have been able to uh, if, if uh, this was uh, live in, in New York. So um, the first one being uh, this uh, nose cone stencil. Um, this is, has a bit of a complicated geometry that uh, is difficult to replicate, but we were able to print this out of um, a recycled PETG, which is what water bottles are made out of. Um, our customer uses this to successfully paint um, their nose cone on the rotors of their airplanes. Um, the next example I wanna show is uh, something I'll talk about a little bit later. It's actually a printed coffee basket. Again, all this stuff, I'm, most of the stuff I'll be showing is made out of recycled uh, water bottles. Um, but this was uh, <clears throat> something that our customer used in uh, on a coffee farm um, in order to uh, uh, collect uh, coffee beans and, and help out their workers. And this is something I'll talk about in more detail later. Um, I also have a piece of a 3D printed chair, uh, which is an example of something that uh, I'll talk about in the next uh, few slides. Uh, this was done in collaboration with Habitat for Humanity and the University of Texas in Austin. Um, <clears throat> a few more things that are uh, pretty interesting. Uh, with pellet printing, you can get into um, a lot more composite materials. So this is uh, a high volume, um, copper and PLA uh, composite material that we printed out. Um, essentially, you can uh, go from this uh, straight to the metal printed the metal printed part um, with just a few post processing steps. Um, and then some other things we've gotten excited about are uh, flexibles. So um, we've got a few uh, TPU printed parts like this air pump. Um, you can do grips and handles for things. Um, airless tires. Um, so there's lots of stuff you can do with uh, with flexible materials that you might not have been able to do with uh, filament-based platforms uh, because you don't have to worry about mechanically constraining the, the filament. Um, and then, <clears throat> of course, I couldn't talk about recycled materials without talking about some of our own uh, parts that were printed out of previously printed parts. So we took uh, failed prints, ground them up, and then threw them back into the GBX and got some stuff out of uh, recycled PET. Uh, recycled PLA, and then finally some polycarbonate. So we've done lots of work and we've done lots of learning. Um, let me get back to the slides here. Um, but a lot of that wouldn't have been possible without um, lots and lots of collaboration. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before that we're, we're working on an NSF funded grant. Um, and through that grant to develop a GBX, we've uh, subcontracted um, 
uh, folks at Michigan Tech University in their most lab, that's the uh, Michigan Open Sustainability Technology Lab, um, led by Dr. Joshua Pierce, who's, uh, whose lab has, has done lots of great work in open source technology, especially around 3D printing um, <clears throat> and uh, analyzing the technology for its validity. So uh, with, in working with them, we've um, done stuff towards hardware validation, process characterization and development um, for our uh, printer. And they've, uh, as a result of that, they published two papers, uh, the first one of which looks into the printability of various thermoplastics through FGF, optimizing printing set settings for uh, recycled materials, as well as uh, doing material testing on those printed parts and comparing them to comparable parts made out of uh, virgin plastics. The second paper uh, explored lots of different use cases, um, <clears throat> such as printing skateboards or uh, snowshoes. Um, out of recycled materials, uh, and then doing a cost analysis of those objects. So some pretty interesting stuff. I'm happy to share links to those um, uh, later on if people are interested. And this research allowed us to push our product into uh, the beta stage of which we have, uh, we do have available for sale for those who want to experiment along with us. And that's what the understanding that yes, it's going to be messy and there's, uh, but there's a lot of exploration for us to do and we're happy to have people uh, willing to come along and share that journey with us. Um, we do use uh, Kickstarter as a fundraising platform. Uh, we've done that multiple times and we're three for three, thankfully, um, for successful Kickstarter campaigns and found it to be very useful um, to let people know about our mission and to let them literally buy into that process early on. Um, but overall, what we're really interested in is how we can open up the discussion um, of how to develop and test our system. Uh, we want to build transparency into our process and do code development, whether it's over conference calls, webinars, uh, et cetera. Um, so uh, going back to some of those objects that I showed you before with the, uh, the, the coffee basket, um, starting in July of 2018, we were able to start working with Sanders Coffee Farms in Puerto Rico. Uh, we visited them in person, observed their work, and, and did interviews with them to understand where use cases might exist for um, creating functional objects out of garbage and recycled plastic. Um, and the research resulted in this basket, which we improved upon uh, over six iterations. Um, and uh, which increase worker comfort and coffee bean yields at the same time. And this is something that they continue to use uh, to this day. And the next collaboration is with uh, UT in Austin and Habitat for Humanity as, as a result of the uh, uh, reverse pitch competition. Um, and we are basically trying to explore uh, some of the val valuable objects we can create from garbage by combining, combining the power of 3D printing with other reclaimed materials. Um, and one product we developed is this chair, um, which is printed from uh, recycled water bottles and assembled with reclaimed wood from Habitat Restore. Um, and what we want to do going forward with this is explore uh, the viable business models that can come out of this type of work, uh, document it, and then share it with our community so people can replicate it. Um, all that being said, um, <clears throat> We'll be the first to admit that while we believe in the work that we're doing and we, we view it as very important to do uh, and we want to share it, uh, we don't always do the best job of doing so. And I think it's uh, uh, very great that I'm, I have the opportunity to, to be here at the summit and to listen and learn from all of you. Um, so I do have a few asks. Uh, first is, um, what are some successful open hardware development workflows? Uh, who are what are some examples of people who have done it correctly and, and how do they do that? And then secondly is in licensing and documentation and basically how do, how do we integrate this into our process? Um, going all the way from development and engineering R&D all the way to um, uh, sharing it with others. What are the platforms uh, for sharing and, and how do people contribute to the work that we're doing? Um, we do have a forum, but I forgot to link it to it, so I'll probably link it into the Discord. Uh, you can email me directly at jarek at re3d.org. Um, <clears throat> and uh, thank you very much for listening. If, if you have uh, some points you want to continue talking about later on, uh, please visit the Discord. My channel is 3D-Sustainable, and hopefully I'll see you there. Thank you.